in front of you is this little form right here. We did this a few years, it's been a few years since we've done this, so I thought it'd be a good time to go back and look at this again. Now, this is your chance to grade the church. What church? This church. This one right here. So um, we're going to go through the activities of the church, the very first church. After the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved that day and were added to the church. And immediately the church was off and running. What kinds of things were they doing way back then, right? They weren't uh, putting things up on Facebook and stuff like that. They were. They were doing the work of the church. What kind of activities? And we're going to see, based on those categories, uh, you're going to give this little church here in Maranatha so many years later, how are we doing in these? Okay? Uh, you can put your name on the slip of paper if you want. Uh, you don't have to. But I'd be interested to see kind of what your grades are. Uh, and also, as you'll see at the bottom, how is Maranatha overall doing? And are there areas of improvement? How are some things? Now, uh, just keep in mind, if you put your name on it and you say there's an improvement, you're in charge. <laughs> so if you don't put your name on it, you can't be put in charge. So, <laughs> so if you want to do that, let's do it. So let's get to what were the activities of the very early church. So let's grab our Bibles. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and again, this is right after the day of Pentecost. As Jesus ascended, he reminded them right before he ascended, he told his disciples to go into Jerusalem and to wait. And for the first time, <laughs> uh, they did it. They actually did what he told them to do. They didn't go to Galilee when they were supposed to, didn't have hope when they were supposed to, but hey, this they did. And they went and they waited in Jerusalem for the coming of the Comforter, uh, the coming of the one who was promised, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't one day or two days. About ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, which is an Old Testament feast uh, that many people from all over the world were in Jerusalem for, uh, we had the Holy Spirit coming upon all of those in that upper room and you had them all speaking, and you have Peter being the main spokesman and preaching a wonderful sermon uh, by the Holy Spirit. First of all, acknowledging that they're not drunk. <laughs> I like how he says, we're not drunk because it's early in the morning. <laughs> no, it can't be. No, we would never do that. So, and, But he spoke and reminded them who Jesus is. And how important it is to know who Jesus is and how they are the ones that put him to death. But now, for eternal life, they must make him their Savior, must put their faith and trust in him. And what was the result? We can see it there in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, the word of Peter, what he spoke, were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a good day. Can you imagine 3,000 people showing up here for church? No. 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 <laughs> no place to park, no place to put them, no way to sit them, not, definitely not enough food. <laughs> so, so, yeah, 3,000 people were added to the church. Now, they didn't have a church building. They didn't do that. In fact, the early church, it was their custom to, on the Sabbath, to go to the temple, right? Uh, Probably all of them were Jews. There may have been a few Gentiles, maybe a few, but we're talking Jews here. They would go to the temple, and in the temple, on the grounds. They would have church services. They would listen to the disciples. And as we're going to see, they took it outside the temple, too. They went to people's houses and things like that, and it grew. What kinds of things were they doing? Let's start in verse 42. And they, the 3,000 plus those who were already believers, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So what did, what's the first thing it talks about them doing? They were doing teaching. And what goes along with teaching? Learning. Learning. <laughs> right? And there's an important little adjective there. Actually, an adverb. Steadfastly, right? They were doing this steadfastly. They had a desire 
to hear the truth. They had a desire to know more about Jesus. They had a desire to know more about salvation. They had a desire to know more about God and what God has done. And they steadfastly continued in the apostles' teaching. So this is Peter. This is James. This is John. This is Matthew. This is all of them sitting there and teaching and telling some things. What did they see? In fact, wasn't that the instruction of Jesus? He told them to what? You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. <laughs> and then where? In Judea. Then where? In Samaria. And then where? In the uttermost parts of the world. And that's what they did. They taught about what they knew. They taught about the word of God as led by the Holy Spirit. So, teaching and learning. Do we still do that today? Oh, yeah, of course, yes. Um... Steadfastly? Well, that's up to you. That's a question. <laughs> is there, there has to be a consistency, right? I mean, we always try to hammer this on the kids. Uh, that you have to be consistent in learning or you lose interest. That's just a fact, isn't it? Uh, if you don't do it consistently, then it just starts, what, slipping away, right? Either you're not hearing it anymore or you're not getting involved in it anymore or you just hit and miss. I don't understand how anybody, well, I knew kids in school that would, you know, miss two or three days a, a week. I was like, how can you know anything when you get back? How can you, it adds on, right? <laughs> it just keeps going. And, and people who, you know, only go to church every once in a while, how can you know what's going on? How can you know what's been taught and where, where we're going and what, how it all fits together? It's just, it is so much information that just coming every once in a while, you can't engage it. And that's why it's so important that they steadfastly continue daily in the teaching and, and in their part, the learning uh, of the apostles and of the truth. So that's what they did. Are we doing that? We certainly do the process So here at Maranatha. So you can give that a grade. What else did they do? What else did it say in verse 42? They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Fellowship. And if you're reading this in the context, the fellowship, of course, would be with the apostles included in that. So this is the apostles' teaching and fellowship, fellowship with one another, but also fellowship with the apostles, with those who had seen Jesus, who had that experience and things like that. But it was also with one another. In fact, jump down to verse 46. And they, this group of people, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they were doing that daily fellowship with the apostles in the temple, but then they were also taking the show on the road, right? <laughs> they were going then to people's houses and having food, breaking your bread and eating Meat is a broad category of food. They were eating together, fellowshipping together, spending time together. Now, who's here ready to have 3,000 people come to your house? No, because I'm sure they had little groups. <laughs> little groups were going out into different people's houses. People were inviting people over so they could kind of keep. And what was the purpose of the fellowship? To get to know each other, but also to kind of continue that conversation. What did the apostles talk about today? What did they say today, right? That's why we go to lunch after <laughs> church on Sunday. It's a good time to kind of talk and get to know each other and discuss things, right? And that's, that's fellowship. Is that fellowship important? Yeah, it is very important. So they had times of fellowship with one another. So teaching and learning and in fellowship one with another. What else did they have? Again, going back to verse 42. So you had continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in what? Breaking of bread and in prayers. And breaking bread is kind of one of those phrases that can mean two things. And if you see verse 46, that kind of breaking of bread is more likely just the kind of um, fellowship. Breaking of bread, eating together, and things like that. In this context, it's more likely this one. Uh, 
It also means communion. And several times in the book of Acts, it refers to breaking of bread as them having communion together, because isn't that what Jesus did? He broke the bread, and then he handed it out to his disciples in the breaking of bread. So it's communion and prayers, right? So you have the sacraments, because he also had earlier, in verse 41, you have baptisms too, right? <laughs> so those who were saved were baptized. You have the baptism, you have the communion, and you also have what? Prayers. Prayers for one another, prayers for this, prayers for that, prayers of praise, and they had prayers. So, do we do those? Yes. It's amazing how these are still part <laughs> of your basic service of the Lord, right? You have teaching, learning, you have fellowship, you have communion, the sacraments, and you have prayers, right? And they continued to do all of these. And they were doing them on a far more regular basis. <laughs> Pretty much they were doing these daily. Uh, and, they, and they kept growing and they kept doing them because they wanted to grow. Uh, they were like a little baby. What happens when uh, Anya gets into a growth spurt? She eats all the time. Eats all the time. <laughs> Wait till they get to be like a teenager. If you ever have a boy, whoo! Anybody seen a teenage boy eat? It is crazy. I bet Tommy was that way. Oh yeah, oh, yeah just an amazing amount. I think back on what I ate in high school. It's like you have to be kidding me. I'd be dead if <laughs> I tried to eat all that. But he does you know, this growth spurt. It's like okay, you know, I, I just had. You know, three Big Macs and four fries, and now where, where can I get some more food, right? <laughs> now I'm still hungry, so let's just keep going. And that's what they're doing. Spiritually, they're growing, and what's their instinct? Give me more. Give me more. Keep feeding me. Keep feeding me because I've got to grow. And how important was that for this group? Because it was really this group that God's going to use to get his message out all over the world, <laughs> right? So through persecution and things like that, these are the people that are going to be going out into all the world and preaching this gospel, and he's getting them fed, and they had a desire to be fed. So they had communion, they had prayers, they had fellowship, they had teaching. What else did they have, starting in verse 44? And all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. They ministered. Again, as I mentioned this morning, I mean, back then, uh, again, most of these, if not all of these, were Jews. And the church, the temple, and the synagogues in the outer areas. Uh, they wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They wanted nothing to do with Christians. And if you were a Jew and you were claiming faith in Jesus Christ, you were out of the temple. You're out of the synagogue. Your boss may fire you. The family may let you go. It doesn't matter who you are. So there were widows who could get no support from family, no support from the temple. There were people disabled and had needs, and there was no way they could get help from family or from society. It was up to the church, and the church ministered as anybody had need, and people were willing. We had people like Barnabas, who got that name, Barnabas, because he was sold his property and gave it all to the church. And therefore, they had all in common, and then they were able to help each other and feed each other and meet each other's needs. Do we still do that today? Does it have to be money? No, it could be time. It could be energy. <laughs> there would be a lot of things that we sacrifice for our family, as we talked about this morning. We are a family. And they had all things in common, and they shared, and if anybody had need, any Christian had a need, they simply came to the church, they came to the apostles, and the apostles had the resources, or could point them the right resources to help somebody so that they could meet their needs. Because does God care about our daily bread? Yeah. Does he know we have physical needs? Yes. Does he care about those? Yes. Is he always going to turn stones into, you know, into bread to feed you? 
<laughs> no, he may just what? Say, hey, neighbor, <laughs> why don't you go share a loaf of bread with them, right? Or go out and help them or give them a ride or whatever it may be. Yes. Well, it never occurred to me before, but not too long after this, they all came under severe persecution. Mm -hmm. And since they'd all already sold their property and had the resources like for themselves yeah. among the Christians, they didn't lose it. Yeah, it's true. The, the Holy Spirit had led them to this particular solution at this particular yeah. time. And then when they came under persecution, they were, mm -hmm. they were prepared. They didn't, they, they had resources already yeah. sold and, and didn't have them confiscated. Yep. And, and in reality, it went well beyond this time. Throughout the book of Acts, Paul's constantly talking about how the fact as he went around, even poorest churches, even, even the ones that really had not a lot, were still gathering money, not just for themselves, but for those in Jerusalem, for those in this church, for those in that area that are under persecution. They cared about each other. They prayed for each other. They met each other's needs. And they had those things in common. So ministering to one another is a big part of the church. And is that something we still do today? Caring about one another and ministering to one another. So that is a job of the church. Okay. Let's go to the next one, verse 46. And they, continuing day with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, we already talked about that in fellowship, but let's put it up there. Eating. <laughs> Eating. That's also a big part of the church, isn't it? Not just Baptists. But it was a big part of opening up. And it's not just the eating part. It is really this. The hospitality, right? They were opening up their houses. It wasn't like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll feed you, but you got to be down, you know, go to the temple and I'll meet you there. <laughs> I don't want you in my house. I don't want you with my stuff. I don't want to open up my life. I don't want to open up my, my place. But they were very hospitable. They were opening up their houses to one another, to people they didn't know. They really knew nothing about, except that they were what? Fellow Christian, and keep in mind too the church, how different the church was. Because some of these were not Jews, maybe by birth. Maybe, maybe they were Jews but were living in another country that spoke another language. Maybe they were people who were poor. Some were disabled. Some came from a very questionable background <laughs> that Jesus had led. Some were Pharisees. And things like that. And the Pharisees opening his home to all those, those people? And the answer was, yeah. He probably had the biggest house. And did he care who was coming? They opened up their house. I guess we Except, don't do that so much today, but things are just different. As necessary, yeah. But, I mean, even then, I know, you know, we open up our house. You know, you open up your yeah, house. Yeah, you, you there, there, there are there are people still, though, who are led, like, I, I'm almost positive my brother told me that last year he and his wife decided they were going to invite people over from their church, like, every week to try to work their way through. And that happened to my, us when we were kids. When I was a kid, some lady in our church who was blind invited <laughs> my parents and I to dinner, to, to lunch at, on Sunday in her house, and she fed us. Like, I, it was amazing. Did she know what it was? Oh, yes. <laughs> <She> <laughs> jokes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and that's the thing. It's that it's that hospitality. It's and it's not just your house either. It's uh, your resources. It's the things you have. Are you willing to share them? Recognizing that who gave us all these things, the Lord. Gave, and that's and again, even more impressive back then. <laughs> Because back then, with all the classes and with all the, you know, the judging and all the things that went on, this new church was an amazing thing, that everybody was equal. And everybody was opening up, and everybody was giving, and everybody was doing those things. Do we still do that today? Or do we still hang on to some of those old hang-ups? So they're doing that. They're eating, yes. But more it's about the hospitality and the opening up and the sharing with one another. Right? Let's go to verse 47. Several here. What's the first one? First two words. Praising God, right? Verse 
praise him, praise him, right? And they, how many think they probably sung? Well, they love they love to sing. <laughs> they have some great songs, right? They would sing, they would praise God, they would glorify God, they would thank God, and they would do that. That was a regular part of their service, is to focus on who? And again, churches can get off of focus. <laughs> and sometimes it's easy to get focused on other things, other issues, other solutions. other. And we need to always focus on him. Focus on God and praise him and be thankful unto him in all that we do. So they praised God. And also in verse 47, and having favor with all the people. Did the other people in Jerusalem notice what was going on? Now, again, a lot of this was being done in the temple. Now, you think, oh, how could, you know, how could that happen? Well, you got to understand how big the Temple Mount is. <laughs> the temple Mount's huge. <laughs> and they would basically just probably take a little corner, a little area over there, and, you know, there were thousands and thousands of people in little groups all over that whole courtyard area, right? And they would kind of get off a little section, and they were doing this. They were praising God, praising Jesus. They were teaching about Jesus, having fellowship, and it was going on, right? And they were there, and they were, people noticed. They noticed that, hey, that guy's opening his house to all those, those people, right? Hey, that guy just sold all of his stuff, and he's sharing it with them. Right? And that got people to notice the love for one another, the ministering to one another, the joy that they had in their praise. People noticed. And they found what with everybody? Favor. People looked at them favorably. That's always my question. Would people look at our church favorably? Like, that's a place I would like to go. That's a place I would like to hang out. Those are people I would like to spend time with. There are some churches, have everybody, anybody ever been to a church where you left going, I really don't care to come back here. <laughs> They're all just kind of, ooh. <laughs> They're all kind of miserable. They're all kind of not really enjoying this at all. And it's just a terrible impression. And the church can give that off sometimes, can't it? Be a little judgy, uh, be a little hypocritical, be a little staid, be a little down, <laughs> be a little scary sometimes. But they, they were witnessing because of how they were praising, how they were teaching, how they were going about and interacting with one another. And they found favor with people. So even if they didn't believe in Jesus, even if they didn't like it, they liked what was going on. They, they were interested in how this was going on. And that's we need to make that kind of impact in the world. The world may not understand, may not even love Jesus, but believe in God and like that. But they should be able to, when they look at it, and say, boy, they're different. They've got something that I would like to have. And that's the witness that the early church had. And what else did they do? They praised God, had faith with people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They grew. We'll put that on there. As God intended, right? We can't get into the uh, idea that, oh, okay, if you're, if you're a growing church, you must be doing everything right. Well, that's not necessarily true. Or if you're not growing, you must be doing everything wrong. You've got to do it differently. Uh, the objective is not to grow in numbers. The objective is to grow in people who are saved, <laughs> Right? Uh, people who are coming and being saved and growing in the relationship with God, not just getting people, bodies in, right? So, uh, and that's what the church was doing. They were growing, growing in numbers of people saved, right? As God intended. So, that was what the early church was doing. So let's ask ourselves, are we doing these things? Are we teaching? Yes. Are we Having fellowship? Are we doing communion and prayers? Are we ministering to one another, meeting each other's needs? Do we have hospitality and time, those kinds of fellowships, just getting to know each other? Do we have praise? Do we spend time praising God? Are we a good witness to those around us? When people know about us, people interact with us, what do they see? And are we growing? Are we seeing people get saved? Are we 
having baptisms? Are we doing those kinds of things and seeing people grow? So I'm going to give you just a few minutes. Does everybody have a piece of paper? And if you want to put down your grades. All right, thank you for this. And again, uh, people at home, if you want to do the same thing, send them in or something, or just bring them next time you're in church. That's good to know. I mean, if you'd like to know how people feel about this, because we do need to make sure that we are doing, we do them. We certainly do them, uh, and that's good. Um, that we we want we don't want to do them just for the sake of doing. We want to do them for the right purpose and uh, be effective in them. So, if you think you think we can do better? Uh, let's keep working on those things. Okay. Let's pray.